Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, so there's this story uh, where Jesus, when he was on the earth, um, Jesus' disciples, they, they're trying to cast a demon out of this kid. And Jesus walks onto the scene and his, his disciples are arguing, arguing with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law about why they weren't able to cast out this demon. And so Jesus shows up and they're like, Jesus, Jesus. And he's like, what's going on? What are y'all arguing about? And they're like, well, we're talking about why we couldn't get this demon out of this kid. And Jesus, he, he's kind of frustrated. He's like, oh, how long am I gonna have to endure you people? He literally says that. You can read the verse. But Jesus is like, all right, guys, let me show you what's up. Bring the kid to me. And that's where we pick up this story with Jesus. It's a fascinating story, okay? And so they brought the boy to him, this boy that had a demon in him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, when the spirit, the demon that was in the boy saw Jesus, this is a weird verse, okay? If, you, if you're like, the Bible's boring. You haven't read passages like this. It's weird stuff. It immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. So he, the demon like overcomes the boy, throws him on the ground. And he starts kind of thrashing around and he fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. Very intense scene where he, I've, I've, I've never seen anything like this. I hope you haven't, but uh, it, I have some friends in Africa and they've told me, they're like, oh, we see that stuff all the time. I'm like, I'm gonna stay over here then. So <laughs> Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? And the father said, from childhood, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. I mean, you hear the resignation in this guy's voice. He's like, we've been trying to fix this my whole life. Man, if you can do anything, that'd be great. But I don't have my hopes up. And I love this. Of course, he doesn't realize who he's talking to. Jesus is like, if you can, like, do you know who I am? And that's a guy that can actually get off saying that. You say, do you know who I am? We're like, no, do you know? Does anybody know who he is? Like, Jesus is like, if you realize who you were talking to, like I'm God in the flesh right here, all powers in my hands. I say it, it happens. If I can, he's like, look, everything is possible for one who believes. Now this is interesting because sometimes we get kind of a, a, a little slightly distorted messages, a message and people say, everything's possible for everyone who believes in themselves. No, because a lot of us, the reason we are where we are today is because we believed in ourselves, <laughs> And look where it got us. Jesus is saying, listen, everything's everything is possible, but it's not because of anything you are. You believed in yourself and it got you to where you are today. But if you believe in the right thing, and it just so happens that this guy was standing in front of the right thing, God, himself. He says, if you believe in the right thing, everything is possible. So immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. This is what we're going to talk about today. The idea that within all of us, man, we do, we really do want to believe, but man, Lord, help us overcome that part of us that just doesn't believe. So when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. He's like, oh man, it's about to get crazy in here. Let's get this done. He says, you deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, <laughs> convulsed with him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many thought he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet and he stood up. Now, this is interesting, okay? Lock in with me here. This is super important. After this, after Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately. Now, this is really important. Whenever you, if you're studying the Bible, and I hope you do study the Bible on your own, whenever you see it says, and you'll see it says this line everywhere in the Bible, all sorts of through the story of Jesus, it'll say, he went in the house. He took them in the house. That is a trigger word to indicate to you that Jesus is about to teach something super deep that's next level. It's for those who want to take their life to the next level. He does all these miracles and thing in public and he shares these parables, but sometimes he just leaves it hanging there. But then he says, for those who really want to know, you got to come, come into the house and I'm going to explain the secrets of the kingdom to you. And this is where, so if you're looking, you say, as soon as you see this trigger word, after they'd come into the house, when they went inside, start paying attention because this is for those of you that want to take it to the next level. And he says something super bizarre. 
They said, why couldn't we drive out that demon? And Jesus replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. And then the chapter ends. What? I'm going to unpack that. But first, I want to talk to everybody in this room because here's what I know about everybody in this room. Every one of us, we have a situation in our life right now that's so hard. And we, we would say something like this, man, I really want to believe, but it's really hard because I really want to believe that God can heal this cancer, but it's really hard because the doctor has said, I've only got six months to live. I really believe, I want to believe that God can heal my mother, my father, but it's really hard because man, I prayed for somebody else and they had it and they died. And I've been disappointed. I feel like God's let me down sometimes. I really want to believe that our marriage can get better. But every time it seems like we're taking a step forward, we take five steps backwards. And then I just get my hopes up for nothing. And we all come to a place. And I've been there the last few weeks. This has just been, I was kind of shared a little bit of my struggle last week that I've been having. And, and we're all at that place, man. It doesn't matter how long you've been work, walking with the Lord. We get to a place where we're kind of like that guy and we come to a place of resignation and say, I want to believe. And really, honestly, I do believe. But Lord, help my unbelief. Because there's a part of me that says, realistically, that's just not going to happen. Because the science isn't there. Whatever the science is saying. Whatever the doctor's prognosis, diagnosis is, Whatever isn't there. And we all get to that place. And you know, I, man, I really want to believe that I can overcome this addiction going back into rehab, but it's really hard because I've been depending on this alcohol, this meth since I was 14 to make it through how painful this life is. I really want to believe I can get over the hump here, but let's just be honest. I know me. And we all get to that place. And I think this guy's story is a great example for those of us who are at that place because he says, man, Jesus, I really do want to believe, but you got to help me. I need you to help me with my unbelief. And really what we're talking about when we, when we talk about this idea of I want to believe, we're actually talking about faith. Faith is what we're talking about. We're talking about this belief in, in, in something we can't see. In fact, the famous verse on this is Hebrews 11. We all know it. It says this, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Now conviction, you know what conviction is? Conviction means like, you know, there's like a conviction in, in the court of law where it pronounces judgment and says, you, are, you did this, right? There's this, it's like an assurance that this is what, the way it is. And the weird thing about our faith is that we, the reason we're here this morning, many of us, is because we have a conviction that there's something out there beyond what we can see or touch or taste, or feel sometimes. We believe there's a God that we can't see. And here's the thing, like what we believe honestly is kind of weird if you think about it. I know as a pastor, I shouldn't be telling you how weird it is what we, th what we believe, but let's just like, let's just get really honest here, rational, okay? We believe in a God that nobody has ever seen. Nobody. In fact, the Bible even says that God said, you can't see me or you'll die. That's really convenient. <laughs> if you're wanting to get somebody to believe in something, you say, well, you, if you see it, you'll die. You just have to believe it on faith. Oh, okay. We believe that this, this, that this God we don't see has three parts to him, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that at one time, God sent his Son, who was also God, to become man but he wasn't really God. He was the son of God, but he was God. This is the weird theology we believe, okay? So God was in the flesh in Jesus, but remember, he wasn't actually God, the father. He was God, the son. Like, wait, what? Huh? And then Jesus left and he sent the third part of the Trinity to hang out with us, the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is not God, the father, and it's not God, the son, but they're all God. This is what we believe. And people come into our faith for the first time and they're like, huh? And we've got our own vocabulary, things we say, you know. God is good. Hey, you know the cue. All right. <laughs> but people come in and they don't know what that means. And they're like, this is a weird thing we believe. But yet, 
you know somewhere deep inside of you and they haven't been able to talk you out of it because you've got conviction. You've seen God do things. You said, I was in a heap of trouble and some powerful force delivered me from that. So you've got that conviction because you know a person with experience is never at the mercy of a person with a theory. And you've experienced God and that's where your conviction comes from. So people come to you and they're like, well, that's a ridiculous thing you believe. is God in the flesh, Trinity, Holy. And then, and then you believe that God himself came and had to die for sins. Like how could one man dying over here, like who wasn't, was like half God, half man, or whatever you say he was, like some superhero. How did he rescue you? And you're like, what? And you go, I don't understand all of it, but I know that I've been changed by the power of it. Yeah. And that's the conviction we have. And so this is, what, this is what Paul says about this. He says, you've got the conviction, right? And he says, and it's by that conviction, by that faith, that the people of old received their commendation. Basically, they got the reward of living by faith. And then he starts this list of like 600 words of people who had faith. We talk about Abraham. We just did a series on Abraham. And God said to Abraham, Abraham, I need you to leave your country and your family and go to a place that I will show you. It's on a need to know basis. I'll show you when you're there. Just start walking. And you go, that was faith. We look at the story of, he talks about the story of Enoch in this Hebrews 11. And Enoch was a guy that he actually had somehow, some, he had pleased God in such a way that God never, he never had to die. Enoch actually just got taken up to heaven. It's a weird story. Another weird story in there, right? He talks about Noah. Talk about faith. Noah, I mean, that looks a little loopy. Like, dude, Noah, what you building that boat for, bro? It's gonna rain, like major rain. <laughs> I'm talking 5,000 year flood here. Like this is, but we're not even the floodplain. This is the 5,000 year floodplain. Trust me here. He's building this boat, but yet God commended him for his faith. And here's what I think he's saying here. He's like, listen, if you want faith for what's ahead, the best thing to do is always look backwards because God has been slowly but surely building a track record in your life of his ability to provide, to care for, to give you the wisdom, to give you the confidence. He's been building his track record. I don't ever believe God asks you to take a giant leap of faith. It may feel like it, but if you'll look back, you'll see, oh, he's been preparing me for this. You feel like you're maybe supposed to step out into a new career or a new field or trying something new and you go, trust me, if God, if God is calling you to do that, he's been slowly preparing you. He's been building his track record in your life, but you've got to be willing to look backwards. Look at those stories of people who walked in the faith. And not only that, look at your personal story, because here's the thing. He's already been working in your life and he was even working in your life before you even acknowledged him. And you know that. And one of the keys is this, look for patterns. Now, listen, if you really want to be a next level thinker, they say that intuition is based on the ability to see patterns. If you want to be really smart and really sharp, the ability to see patterns is what will save you so much trouble in life. Okay. For example, there's a, here's a, here's a negative example. Have people come up to me, a girl will come up to me and say, hey, I don't know, is this guy the right guy for me? Should I marry him? And I'm like, well, he's leaving his wife to marry you. That will lead to a pattern. And if he was willing to leave her to hang out with you, he's going to leave you to hang out with her. Pattern. And the thing is, we know this kind of in Intuitively, we're like, well, you know, but I'm unique. And you're like, well, no, patterns don't really care about your uniqueness. <laughs> Principles don't care about your uniqueness. I am such an attractive person that if I jump out of a plane, I will fly. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Principles are patterns. And they're laws and rules that have been put in place that if you break them, they'll break you. And so the challenge we have is we have to look for patterns. But here's the thing. God has a lot of positive patterns. We've seen his faithfulness in the past. Now, a lot of times it's led to some disappointment, but we've, we've all seen in the past his faithfulness to take us where, he, where we are today. And one of the keys is you've got to be willing, 
when God calls you to look forward to say, okay, God, I'm going to trust you, but I'm going to trust you based on my past experience with you. Because that's the key right there. He's been building a track record in your life. And whatever he's asking you to do now, what he did in the past is indicative of what he will do in the future. So you've got to look for those patterns. That's what we talked a few weeks ago. I did that series on, on the circle perspective about how God works in our life less in a straight line. He works more in circles. And you find yourself coming back around to the same themes, same concepts, kind of same challenges sometimes, but they look a little different. And God is always working in your life, but most of the time you can't see it when you're in the middle of the struggle. You just have to live by faith, believing, God, I want to believe Help my unbelief. You have to believe that he actually is working and you only get the luxury of understanding what he was doing by looking backward because life is lived forward, but it can only be understood looking backward. So we step out in faith saying, God, I don't know how this, I don't know how this is possible. Like, I don't know how you're going to, if you, you can heal me, I don't know if you're going to heal me, but I'm going to keep living in faith that you can heal me. The doctors have said it's impossible, right? I'm going to keep living in faith that this marriage can get better. It looks impossible. It's, we're looking at 20 years of struggle here. It's been a struggle since the day we said I do. But I believe. Help my unbelief. And then start looking back at his faithfulness to this point. And start seeking him. And, and, and here's this, there's this, this verse we all know really well. It says this. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Now, this is what's interesting to me, because the more I walk with the Lord, the more I realize he doesn't necessarily want you to be confident and certain about everything. He just wants you to trust him, which is faith. And we, we, we applaud certainty, those people that just you know, it just never looks like they waver in their faith. They're just like, yes, I know what I'm doing all the time. But most of those people serve a very small God, a God that they can put in a box. And when God asks them to do something out of the box, they get freaked out and don't do it. And this is the challenge that God has been speaking to me over the last few months. Because here's the thing, I've heard this verse my whole life. And I've been asking him for stuff, some stuff and he hasn't been doing it. And I've been seeking him and I feel like he's silent. And this is one of the, the real challenges. When you first come to Christ and you start seeking him, you start, you know, prayer through prayer. Um, he, he will do just miraculous things through prayer. I've seen with new Christians, man, they're asking for stuff that I'm just like, well, good luck asking God for that. And he does it for them. It just blows my mind, man. So if you're new to the faith here, man, you need to start asking God for some big stuff. <laughs> Ask him for a car, man. He might do it. He might just do it because there's this thing like he wants to build that track record in your life. But here's the thing. The longer you walk with God, here's what ends up happening. He gets more and more quiet. And he's just doesn't work like a slot machine anymore. And you get frustrated and I've been hanging out in the church for about 43 years now, walking with the Lord, you know, 38 something years like that. And, and, and the longer I walk with him, the more silent he seems to get. But here's what happens. Here's what I'm convinced of. There comes a point in your faith where it's like a teacher. When a teacher has been preparing you and teaching you the material, and they've been teaching you all this material, and then they give you the test, and then they sit back in the corner silently and wait for you to take the test. And you raise your hand, teacher, teacher, I need help. On nope, nope, can't help you on that. I got to see that you've internalized what you've been seeking and asking for. I got to see, actually, what I got to see is if you've actually been paying attention in the course, which brings up a really important point. What you pay attention to reveals what you truly value. Have you been paying attention to what God's been trying to teach you? Or have you been so focused and this is the challenge for me, okay? I get focused on what I want him to do for me. God, I need you to do this for me. And man, when you're, when you're first walking in the faith, because he wants to show you his faithfulness, he'll often do things for you. But the, the more you walk with him and he's seeking maturity, and maturity is this. I don't have to tell you to get up in the morning and get dressed. 
change your clothes, eat breakfast. You're on a routine of maturity. That's what maturity means. My daughter, literally every morning, it's a battle for me. Elise, we do this every morning. Put your clothes on. Eat your breakfast. Put your shoes on. Comb your hair. Like the basic stuff, right? But as you walk with the Lord, he's seeking maturity and he wants to know that you've got this stuff internalized. And so what happens oftentimes is he gets really quiet and you're seeking him and you're praying and you're knocking and he's not doing what you want him to do, but he is doing something, but it has nothing to do with what's going on out here. It has to do with what's going on in here because the longer you walk with the Lord, the more the work he does is under the surface. And you don't see it. You don't even necessarily feel like he's doing it. And all the miraculous things he used to do, he stops doing them. Now he's still doing something miraculous. Don't doubt that. But it's inside of you in a place you can't see it. And all of a sudden you start to realize, hmm, I've been so focused on what's going on around me. I've been paying attention to what's going on around me. And that showed what I truly value. But here's the thing. What you pay attention to also shows you what you worship. And sometimes what we're worshiping is what God can do for us instead of him. And I am guilty of this. I love Jesus. Lord, I believe. I also really want you to do some cool stuff for me. And there comes a point where he goes, I'm not necessarily going to do the stuff for you that I used to do for you, man. Because you're mature enough now that you don't need that for some sort of an affirmation of that I'm here. You've got to trust deep down inside that as you ask and seek and knock, you're going to get an answer, but it may not be the thing you were looking for. But the answer you get will be the answer you need. And the more I walk with God, the more I'm convinced the journey that I got, the adventure I got was exactly the one I needed. And at the time I'm like, God, no, this is like, no, I, I needed that over there. I needed to go on that path. He's like, nope, this is the path you needed right here. And I was seeking and knocking, but what I realized is I was actually worshiping the wrong thing. I was looking for the wrong thing. I was asking for the wrong thing. But the good thing about the grace of God is he actually gives you what you need. And here's the thing. That's where the track record comes in. That God is, his plan for you is what you would want your plan to be if you knew all the details. But you don't know the details. And what he has for you is so much bigger than what, the, you know, it's like that small God in a small box. C.S. Lewis, I used this analogy last, last week, but C.S. Lewis compares it to a little kid playing in a mud puddle and they're having so much fun in a mud puddle and Jesus shows up. He's like, hey, I want to take you to the beach. It's a beautiful beach with blue water. And you're like, oh no, no. but look at my mud puddle. It's so fun here. And he's like, yeah, you have no idea what fun is. I'll show you what fun is, but you got to trust me to take you away from the mud puddle that you know to the beach that you don't know. And that's where all of us get at some point. We go, okay, God, like, I believe there's something better, but all I know is this mud puddle. And he's like, I know. So just trust me to take you where I'm going to go. But you got to follow me and you got to have faith in that. And you got to stop worshiping what you know. And you've got to surrender yourself. And this is what he's been really working with me is, I've been wanting him to do all this stuff out here. And he's like, nope, I need to do some stuff in you before I can do stuff through you. And that's been the struggle for me. And, I, and I'm fighting it, just honestly, because I think I know what I need. Yeah, you do too? Yeah, it's all right. No, what I need is, I need to sell a million books. And he's like, no, no, that's not what you need. And that's where this comes in. That weird thing Jesus said at the end where he's like, this kind can only come out by prayer. What? What does that mean? And listen, there's probably some deep, deep stuff that's way above my pay grade that's in there theologically. But here's what I think it means. There's certain stuff that only when you get in prayer is it going to be resolved in your life. And it may not actually resolve what's out here. It may have to resolve what's in here because here's the thing. When you submit yourself to God, it's like getting under an umbrella. There's a, there's a, submission is a word that we, we try and avoid. Like who likes submission, right? Submission, that's not a popular thing to talk about. But submission is so important because submission puts you under some power and authority. 
It's like going out into a storm, like, I can do this and do this. And you're getting wet and rained on, but when you put, somebody brings an umbrella and puts it over you, you're protected from those things. And there's an element that comes when you submit yourself to God and you say, God, I don't know how you're gonna do this, but I'm trusting that your power is going to work through me here. It's not anything I can do, but with you, all things are possible. And there's certain things that only prayer can resolve. And because when, when, when you're in prayer, I think I, I'm having a shift in my mindset about what prayer is. Now, you'd think I would have figured this out earlier, but I'm slow. Prayer isn't so much about what, God, what I'm asking God to do for me as what he wants to do in me. Yes. And it's getting myself in line with him. Amen. And there's one level of prayer we do. Ask God for things. It's good to ask God for things. But the most important thing you can do is surrender and say in prayer, Lord, like Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. And that's where the power comes. Jesus' greatest moment of power came as he surrendered his will for that final time and said, all right, your will be done. And, and all of a sudden he redeemed the world. And I think that's an example for us too. There's certain things in life that you're not gonna have the strength you need without a prayer of submission and surrender to God and then trusting his track record. Trusting his plan for you is what, he, what you would want your plan to be if you knew all the details. But you've got to recognize that the faith you need to move forward is going to come through you spending time in prayer and saying, God, not my will, but your will be done. I'm trusting you. I'm trusting your way. And I'm going to stop trying to figure it out on my own. And I'm going to give it to you. Because here's the thing. I want to believe I really do want to believe. But as I look at the situation around me, I don't see any way you can do it. So help my unbelief. And that's where prayer comes in and saying, I'm surrendered. I'm surrendered to whatever you want to do. And that's where the power comes from. And it doesn't make any sense. It's, one of the, it's another one of those things that we believe in the Christian faith that by humbling yourself and through submission, you ain't actually gain power. It's weird stuff we believe. But it works. It works, right? Yes. So here's my encouragement to you guys. Listen, whatever you're going through right now, you're saying, man, I really want to believe. I really want to believe that God can heal me, that this marriage can get back on track, that you can restore that relationship with my son or my daughter. But the stats don't look in my favor. But here's what does look in my favor. I'm looking back at your faithfulness. And I'm going to humble myself and I'm going to stop being so focused on getting the results I want from God and saying, God, Get your results from me that you want by working in me. And then just let it go and see what happens. You're probably going to be blown away. This is what I've been walking through myself. So uh, I'll, I'll let you know how it goes. If it does not work out, I promise I will tell you. <laughs> but I believe it will work out because you know why? Every time I've done it in the past, it's worked. Every time I've surrendered to him and stopped trying to figure it out and just humbled myself, he does what, he's, what only he can do because with him, all things are possible because he's the one who has all the power. So let me pray for you. God, we thank you so much that you are working in us. I pray for those this morning that are saying that, man, I, I really believe, but help our unbelief, that part of us that's saying, I just don't see any way. Lord, I pray that as we pray to you, you would help us recognize that regardless of what you do on the externals, through prayer, we're connecting with the internals of what you wanna work within us. It's that you're that silent teacher sitting there saying, I want you to internalize what you've been paying attention to. What have you been paying attention to? Is it the right thing? And if our attention has been on the wrong thing, Lord, if our attention has been on what God can do for us rather than who we can be through him, Lord, I pray that you would redirect our attention this morning and help us recognize that you are ultimately what we need to ask for, seek, and knock on that door to get. When we've got you and nothing else, we've got everything. So I pray for anyone this morning. Lord, I pray for those that are struggling with, with sickness, illness, and diagnosis for health, and marriages that are on the rocks, and financial situations that are on the rocks, jobs that are on the rocks. Lord, I thank you, Lord. The most important thing is what's happening inside of us through it. And we know that you will complete that work. You began a good work. We'll be faithful to complete it. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.